So what are we here for today? This is a discussion about the exam 70-464. It's the SQL data platform exam at the expert level. How many of you have certification? How many of you are not certified? That's probably the easier question. So you're new to certification, excellent. How many of you have previous certifications? What about SQL related certs? Okay, what's your most recent? Okay, so the, some of the 2012 stuff. How about you, sir? 2008. Okay. So let me set some expectations for today. I am not here today to teach you SQL. There is not enough time. I am more than happy to have you come and sit a five-day class or more. Um, and you'll find that when you, when you come and take a class from me, I am also over-caffeinated, and I have a tendency to forget to give you breaks and lunches and let you out at the end of the day. I just don't think of it. I get excited. That may happen today. <clears throat> so it's not a class on SQL. What I want to do is make you aware of some of what's being tested and give you some insights so you can decide, am I ready to take these exams. Where are my gaps? We'll also see some examples of question types that you may see on an exam. Lastly, I have a lot of different references for resources, mostly free, that are available for you to spin up virtual machines, talk to other people that are in the same situ situation, interested in certification. So with that, let's roll. So how many of you are actually currently using, so you're implementing SQL Server on at least one machine and you're working with it? Okay, almost everybody. Nowadays that's important. Most people will not be able to pass this exam or any of these exams by reading a book. That's intended. Um, you'll find that one in, in 10,000 will but most people, you should not be able to do it without any prior experience with this version of the product. So you'll want to get in there and use the version to see how it behaves and what it does for you. I've got a four-step process, and this is the actual process that I use, is identifying first, what is your point? So why are you getting certified? How many of you are getting certified because your job requires it? Got one. How many of you just want to upgrade your skills and stay employed? So as a Microsoft trainer, I have to have it to teach it. So every year I budget a certain amount of time and money to keep my skills up. And I do have to tell you, when Microsoft decides to release updates to the entire product catalog in the same year, it makes it a little difficult. So this year, there's a huge amount of my budget going towards new certifications that are all rolling out. So we're going to talk about identifying your goal. Why are we doing this? Filled, we'll talk about finding our knowledge gaps, filling our knowledge gaps, and then lastly, talk about the exam itself. So in terms of the exam portfolio for Microsoft certifications, I want to make you aware of what's out there. So if you've taken things in the past, Microsoft has changed the acronyms and the program significantly over the years. Currently, we are using a four-level certification track. Top tier is, or the lowest tier, is the Microsoft Technology Associate. That was originally implemented as a resource for high school, college people um, to get started in a technology career. Microsoft Learning last year rolled out the program and expanded it to encompass everybody else. I recommend this exam for people sometimes that are intimidated by exams in general. You get a feel for the exam. For career changers, you have got somebody in another department that wants to come in and become a SQL admin before you spend a lot of time and energy getting them trained up, do they have the aptitude? 
So this is a great place for that exam to see, do they have the right mindset to want to be an admin? Then we've got the Microsoft's Certified Solutions Associate. This particular level is generally all about the doing. It is a version-specific set of exams that test your knowledge on actually implementing. There are three exams in that set, and we'll take a look at them. Following that, we have the MCSE. This is the Microsoft Certified Solutions Expert. In the past, Microsoft has used that acronym before. It was Certified Solutions Engineer. It's different, and we'll talk about what the differences are to the program. So the name means something significantly more than it did in the past. Lastly, we have the Microsoft Certified Solutions Master. This particular program requires an extensive knowledge-based exam plus a very extensive lab-based exam where you will get real-world, deep-level problems to solve and you have to go just do it. In terms of the MCSA SQL track, so these are the supporting exams that support the exam that we're going to talk today. <clears throat> so this is your core technical skills. There are three exams. 461 is all about querying SQL. In previous iterations of SQL exams, what you would find is this SQL queries questions spread out through the different exams. And Hiring managers told Microsoft, we need something that tests people coherent in a coherent way on the SQL stuff. I need to be able to unleash somebody and have them be our person of, that writes the views and the stored procedures and the SQL code. So we have an entire exam built around SQL statements. Secondly, we've got the 462. 462 is all about administration, day-to-day -day administration. How do I set up redundancy? What are the hardware requirements? Things of that nature. Care and feeding of the SQL Server to keep it alive and happy day to day. Lastly is the 463 exam for this track. So this is all about implementing data warehouses. This, amongst the three of this track, are the, is the one that's making a lot of people very unhappy. So a lot of people were either in the online transaction processing space or we're in the data warehousing BI space. A lot of times, the two do not talk. Microsoft recognized and hiring managers ask that you may not be doing it today, but at some point, you may need to build the cubes or structure a database to support data warehousing. So getting it ready to be accessible by BI people. So the skills, there's a lot of overlap, but there's a lot of disconnect. Go ahead, sir. Does it make so many changes? Um, are there any upgrade paths up or is it still? There are indeed. And uh, I'm going to refer you to the learning page for the exact number because I didn't put it on the slide, but there are some upgrade paths that will get you from your SQL Server 2008 up. So, for you to be a well-rounded SQL person and a well-rounded expert, you need to have some awareness of the BI space. So this will not be designing the star schemas or the other schemas or the high-level um, recommendations. This is the actual doing. I need you to build me a reporting database. I need you to build me these things. So it's implementing. Once you have those three, you have the MCSA. So those are version specific. Once you take them, you have them. On top of that, we have the data platform MCSE, Microsoft Certified Solutions Expert Exam. There is one other solutions expert exam currently for the SQL track. It's the business intelligence track. They'll be talking about that later on today. So you're not just building something that if somebody asks you or building an index, you are designing the entire system to do what you need it to do from a business perspective. The note at the bottom is really important. 
back in the MCSC days, with the old acronym, those things never expired. People relied on that, le the, that acronym on their resume, but after a few years in technology, it's out of date. Microsoft has recognized this, and all of the new certifications going forward at the expert level expire. What's important today is not going to be the same three years from now. So you need to do a recertification in three years at max from the date you pass your last exam to get this certification. Um, what that means to recertify is still under discussion at Microsoft, so there's nothing to release, but it will be in that period. So you'll see something coming out about it probably toward the end of this calendar year. Generally, yes. And that part doesn't require, Yeah, so once you have the exam passed, you pass the exam. A couple of years from now, when they up to 2014, there will probably th be the similar MCSA stuff for the 2014 version. But once a solution expert, always, as long as you keep it up. And really, the thought is, just like a real estate agent, a lawyer, or a nurse, you have to get your continuing education in and then renew. Like the Say again? Like the I'm not hearing the last part you said. Well, it's essentially, it's, it's sort of analogous to that, but it's, I don't know that it's going to be quite the same. So instead of upgrade, it's really going to be something like, well, let me give you a for instance. How many of you are using SQL Azure online? So, so, and that's the general feeling is we're, we're exploring it, but maybe not, or at some point we want both local on-premise stuff and online, and we want them to share and play nice together. That's really in its infancy. Come three years from now, you know, if the, if the track and the push from Microsoft is the same, you're going to have to be very fluent in SQL Azure. So that's the kind of things, you know, what's important then? So if you are projecting you know, a high availability, that's an important feature now. It's going to get more important as things get more geographically distributed. So you can expect, come recertification, you'll need more awareness on that. So how do I get to this MCSE? There are two exams. But you also have to have that MCSA. So there really are a total of five exams, 461 through 465. You can do them in any order that you like. You just don't get the title until you complete the requisite exams. <clears throat> Armando is going to be doing a session on 465 following mine. So I invite you to stay and learn more about that. So who's this for? This is for the people, not necessarily the DB admin, not necessarily, so it might be the, the people helping the DB admin, the people that are writing the queries and creating the views, it's not necessarily architects, it's the doers, the implementers. You give them guidance and say, this is how I need it implemented, go do it, go test it, tell me when you're done. That's who this is targeting. You will have difficulty passing this exam without live experience working on the product so that you know how things act. Having said that, what I want to I want to reinforce is that this is not I'm, I'm not trying to say that it's a UI centric. There is no point and click. Um, and I'm not at, you, know, you should not be asked where do you point and click to get something done. It's really about what is the flow to get something done. But that is what we're testing here, more on concepts and real-world situations than ever before. I want to walk you through uh, the functional groups so you get a feel for what's on this exam. Specifically, implement database objects. Build me a table. Build me an index. And you'll see 
the importance. 31% of the exam roughly is on building those types of objects. We also have programming objects. What's a programming object? Yeah, function, user design functions, stored procedures, views, triggers, could all be considered that, CRLR objects. Designing database objects. So how should I design the index? Not just building it. This part is all about which field should I include? How should I set it up to get the best performance? And lastly, optimizing and troubleshooting queries. How many of you are comfortable looking at query execution plans? Notice my hand is not up. A couple years ago at TechEd, there was an entire book on reading execution plans. I bought the book. I've read it several times. It still won't stay in my head. It's just, it just me. So we've identified a certification goal. The next step is to actually figure out what your gaps are. This section, I'm actually, I've got a bunch of resources for you and a bunch of places for you to look to find the information that's going to help you identify what your issues are and wh what you need to do to pass this exam. I will mention that the slide decks will be going up online. Uh, we pass them off to the, the event staff and then, then they upload them to Channel 9. So I can get them, get them available to you. The first place you should start, and you should always visit here at least once in your preparation process, is microsoft.com forward slash learning. Go visit the page for your specific exam. For me, I just type it in the, in the, the, box, the search box up at the top. It brings you directly to this page. A lot of useful information. Who the exam is for, who it's not for, skills measured, preparation materials. There's actually a link now that you can actually schedule to links you to the Prometric site so you can register for an exam all in one place. The learning site has recently been rebranded so there's a new look and feel to match the Microsoft corporate look and feel. Specifically, I wanted to bring in the skills measured section. What you're seeing here are the four functional groups of the exam. When you take an exam, at the end of the exam, you're going to get a score report, and it's going to have a bar chart, in this case with four bars. So the bars represent relative performance for each of the functional groups. So if you do fairly well on three and not so well on the fourth, you want to come back here, click on the fourth, and see all of the various topics, and then start researching those topics. For me, one of my typical ways that I study for exams, I print this out. And then I go, cross out. I know how to do this. I know how to create a stored procedure. Cross it out. When you're done with that exercise, see what's left. That's where you need to start studying. While you are here, you know, we have the, it's a little unfortunate it's a Thursday because you're finding out about resources now, but uh, just across the hall, we've got the study hall. We've got practice exams for free. Everything that Measure Up and Transcender has is available for your use this week. That's a good thing. Um, they're typically subscription or online based, so you can, make, you can get those resources. Um, if you want to try one out just to see how do, I, how do I fit, what you'll find is that this particular exam doesn't exist yet. So just like me, the practice, practice, practice exam vendors are a little behind schedule. Um, they got, they knew, like all of us knew, that the product wave was going to be big. And they're just trying to catch up. So you will see a lot of new offerings from both vendors related to SQL and other sorts over the summer. I'm aware of several in the SQL path coming your way. If you take a practice exam here or elsewhere, Focus on the concept that you're testing, not specific questions. If you take exam questions, the live exam questions, or different vendors practice exams, they're all going to be focused on those same four functional groups. But if it's me writing or you writing, it's going to come out different. So focus, what is it they're trying to test? Use the supporting documentation. A lot of people just kind of click through and take the exam and never look at the links or the explanations, this is correct because, this is incorrect because. 
I find that's the most useful information for me when I am having difficulty with a section is to say, what's his rationale, the writer's rationale, for telling me this is correct or incorrect? Exactly. So the comment was, you know, even if you get it correct, look at the explanation because it will glean information that will help you elsewhere. So fill in, it fills in a lot of gaps. Just like the live exam, these practice exams will give you the bar chart. So you can identify which sections you did well on or not well on. So I'm going to show you my, this is my practice exam technique. I will take a standard exam, whatever the vendor gives you, 25, 30 questions, whatever it is. I'm going to do it in certification mode. Don't show me any answers. I just want to pretend like I'm in the live exam. And I want the bar chart at the end. After that, I'm going to identify the one or two sections where I did most poorly. I'm going to go back and create a custom exam. So all of these vendors allow you to say, Give me only 20 questions. Give me all the questions. Give me only things I've answered incorrectly more than twice. Um, in my case, give me only the questions, and in fact, give me all of the questions from this section. So you may see in that one section 10, 20 questions from that vendor, different ways of getting to the same kind of knowledge. Then what I'll do is if I have time and, and if I'm buying it, if I have the money, I'll buy the same product from the other vendor. I'll do the same thing. Look at just that one section. Yes, sir. So for an individual, Measure Up and Transcender are going to be fairly similar. I'm going to mention Measure Up because I saw it yesterday. The, uh, there was a 109 was a download price if you wanted a CD to download the whole thing. And then they have a 30 and 60 day subscription. And I want to say they're in the 49 to 69 dollars range, US. Uh, both of those vendors do a lot of promotions. Go to their site and add yourself to their spam, I was going to say spam, their mailing list. Uh, because they do frequent promotions. Uh, Measure Up just ran one that was like 40% 40, 40 off a whole set of exams. They also offer bundles. So if you wanted whatever they have for the entire SQL 2012 track, they'll give you a significant discount for buying blocks. Additionally, if you work for a company, a lot of companies, you can buy a corporate subscription that makes the product available for big groups. A lot more companies are doing that now that are certification focused to make it available for their employees. Take a class. For each one of these certifications, there is an instructor-led Microsoft official course. MCTs are required to teach those courses at uh, Microsoft's training partners. We're also required to have the certifications to teach it. For this particular exam, there is a single class that's targeted directly at the exam. It's 10776. I left the other one up there for the 465 to show you the new numbering convention. So when the SQL courses were coming out, Microsoft was in the process of updating the numbering. Each course that is exam specific is targeted, so it's a sort of a one-to-one -one relationship. The course alone will not, in 99.99% .99 of circumstances, be sufficient for you to pass an exam. It's supposed to get you proficient at a lot of things, and then you need to do further work and actually work, use the product to get there. But notice the new naming convention. The exam is 465. The course is 20465. 20 is English, and then the exam name. The 464 class was just before they made the naming change, and they decided not to go back and rename it because it was already in market. New feature from Microsoft Learning. They have certification study groups. So you'll notice this um, borntolearn.mslearn.net. This is Microsoft Learning's social media site. They have blogs, question and answer forums, announcements from Microsoft about new exams, new promotions, all sorts of things. Get in the discussion. For each exam, 
there is both a forum and a wiki. I am actually one of the moderators for the SQL exam study group. So if you have questions, what you'll find is it's not a lot of people yet relative to some of the news groups that you might be parts of out in, the, out in the world, but it is growing fairly rapidly. People are starting to notice and they are interacting. So people are sharing resources. Hey, here's a great site that really does a good job of explaining high availability. You can ask questions and if we don't have the answers, we'll point you to the right places or we'll find the answers for you. But it's a great place to get involved. There's also a training and certification forum on MSDN. So MSDN is the keeper of all of the official question and answer forums. This forum is more geared towards how do I register for an exam? I'm having an issue. I took an exam. It doesn't show up in my transcript. Um, I've got a technical question about certification. I don't understand what path I need to get where I need. Um, <clears throat> so that is out there in live. This is very heavily visited. Um, I also moderate that forum. So if you ever need to contact me, that's another way to get me, is put a question in there. Other lab resources. So at least one person in the room said that they have not st stood up SQL Server 2012 yet. And I keep saying, you need that hands-on experience. How do you get it if you don't have an instance yet? One of the places to get it is virtual labs. The product groups at Microsoft have for years put, vir put virtual machines up in the cloud for you to try out. So just having a Microsoft account, you would simply log on, choose a lab, it will launch a virtual machine and then a lab manual. You don't necessarily want to do this on a wireless connection. You'll be disappointed with performance. And if you have a second monitor, so you can put the manual on one and the VM on the other, makes a phenomenal experience. Similar to what we have in hands-on labs. In fact, those are running in the cloud. These virtual labs are typically put by the product group to introduce new features or features that users have been calling support and registering re support requests against. So if they say, too many people seem to be implementing this incorrectly or unsatisfactorily, they will put a lab to explain, here are some best practices and some step-by-steps to make this happen. Difference between the two is TechNet is going to be more IT pro related. MSDN is going to be more of a developer flavor. You might find different labs, or well, you will find different labs in both sets. They both have their own tables of contents. And you might find that some of the developer and TechNet stuff has overlap and has value for you. So this gives you real world experience. The other place I want to walk you through is the Microsoft Virtual Academy. This is another resource that's been around for years, but it's underutilized and un not well known. It has started to explode in the last six to eight months because of some changes that Microsoft has made. Specifically, they are doing live, live webcasts called Jump Starts. Have any of you taken a Jump Start? Are, have any, are you aware of them? Okay, not, not too many, and you'll see more marketing related to that coming forward and you will see some SQL jump starts. I'm aware of several that are in the works. Uh, <clears throat> what they are, two people, typically sometimes as a trainer, but a uh, product group person with, they'll do a day or two of a live webcast where you can ask questions. It's somewhat certification focused but it gives you really deep access to the technology and you can talk to the product group people. After these jump starts, they parse and break apart the videos that they've recorded and put them up for you to watch. There are also white papers and all sorts of other good resources to go visit. Okay, the next step is to fill the gaps. So what we're going to do is kind of walk through the sections, and I don't want to just read the slides, I want to just say, ask questions, say some of the things that are important, and what is the level of kind of questions we're asking at in these exams. 
We've got some sample questions in here. These are not written by Microsoft. They're not lifted from Microsoft content. They come out of my, my own brain just to give you a flavor of the way we can ask questions. That's really the intent. So if I made a mistake, because a lot of these were done in the middle of the night after visiting Bourbon Street, um, don't focus on that. Focus on the way that we're asking the questions and what you, need, what you can expect when you take an exam. So we'll start, start here. So creating and altering tables. How many of you have done it in the UI? So most people have built it in the UI. How many of you have done it with SQL? OK. The expectation in the exam is that you can do both. Because we don't want to be UI specific, I don't want you to have to remember where you have to go to point and click. I want you to know how to build a table. You'll find that the default is we may present you with some SQL code that builds a table and ask you what's wrong or why is it not doing what it's supposed to do. So in a lot of SQL related exams, questions will come out as SQL text because that's a better way to get an understanding without relying on UI knowledge. <clears throat> Managing tables using triggers. How many of you have built a trigger and actually got it to do what it's supposed to do? Uh, I had horrible time over the years. I was using them and I had triggers upon triggers upon triggers upon triggers. Um, so I didn't do a very good design on some of these databases I was playing with. So you click the button to commit a transaction and then go take a coffee break because it was kind of cascading and I actually had some that rec were recursive. So, you know, as a developer, I'm really good at building infinite loops. So when should I use triggers? When is each type appropriate? What happens if you have a delete trigger? What happens to the data when you click the delete button and kind of, or you run the delete SQL statement and hit enter? Where does the data go? Does it go directly to forever gone? It actually goes into a temporary space, a buffer, as it were, a, a, a deleted table. And one of the things that's been important for many versions of SQL is understanding where the data goes and what can I do with it. So that, as far as you're concerned, that's a real row. You can work with it. You can compare it to what did they put in versus what was in that deleted. So you can compare the differences and then decide, do I need to roll it back and undo it if they did something I don't want them to do? So you need to understand the different types of triggers, the repercussions of using triggers performance-wise. What other ways do you have of doing the same thing? So what are the log, like for instance, a lot of people use triggers to do change tracking. You know, the first one I, time, I tried doing was actually you touch anything in one of these rows, it writes something to another table. So what are the alternatives to SQL 2012 or SQL 2008? What can you do now? Change, change tracking is built in. So how many of you have implemented a change tracking mechanism either with a built-in stuff or something you built with triggers? And in a typical group, a small percentage and sort of peripherally aware of change tracking is built in, but I've already got something in place that works. This is one of those things where we're going to ask you performance wise, does it make sense to have all of these triggers and other artifacts or does it make sense for me to sort of upgrade or modify and use some of the built in tools? My default position is often when there's a built in tool that you can tweak and modify a little bit that will be high, more highly performant than homegrown solutions. Absolutely. So it, it is a great learning exercise to figure out, it's well said, um, how you can do it. How would I implement this? And I have a bunch of small databases set up on a server at home that I actually use. I do things like this. I, I turn my music on, I go up to my office, and I start mucking around, see if I can break something, and then try to fix it. Data versioning. 
timestamps, row stamps, sequences. How many are you using sequences in your SQL code? And, and this is another one of these things that's important. What is the relationship if I have a couple of tables and the foreign key depends upon something that's based on a sequence in the primary table? What am I allowed to change or not change? How do the two interact? And I'm not sure if you're seeing a theme here, but the theme is not just, I know what it is. I need to take the fact that I know what it is and then take that next level and apply that. So what happens to that row if I try to update it and it references a sequence? And then all the artifacts, temporary tables, variables. What's the difference between the two and when can I use each? Which situations is it appropriate? Got a first sample question. You will see multiple choice questions on exams. So people have taken the MCSA 2008 primarily, or the, the, a lot of the items were multiple choice, is that correct? Um, and you will find the tide is turning. So we're going to introduce you to some of the other changes. But a standard multiple choice question. Um, I put the brackets in there just so I could contrive a question the way I wanted it. But basically, I'm going to substitute, put in a table name. So where I'm going with this, is it a temporary table? Is it a table variable? So if you take a look at the four answer choices, so temporary tables, table variables, other things. Which would you put there? So what kind of thing makes sense there based on what we're trying to do? When you see these items, make sure you read the requirements section. Generally starts at the goal. You need to do something. Read all the answer choices. Read that goal statement again. Make sure you don't miss the intent of the question. So I want that text literal string of new value output when the select statement runs. And in this case, the tip is start eliminating things that is, you may not know the correct answer, but you say, this makes absolutely no sense. Throw it out. You throw out one answer, you just improved your odds. They're not 25, they're now 33% for this type of item. And then make a selection. Go with your gut. Go with your instinct. If you're doing this stuff on a regular basis and you say, I think I know, but I'm not sure, usually your gut instinct is the one that's going to be most correct. If you go back and keep going back, you will generally find that you just took something that was correct and broke it. Really important to understand the security roles. In the developer world, in the SQL world, one of my biggest hurdles is security. As I mentioned, I deal with local government small business, so I don't need to worry about security. They log in, they want the, thing, the programs to automatically start up for them and be logged in. Security stuff has never stayed in my head. What are some of the security concerns in SQL? Who can get into the databases? Who can access certain stored procedures, views, other objects? Who should be specifically denied permissions to those objects? Other issues related to this that you need to be aware of are if I have permissions to create a table, I create a table, and then I'm, somebody else wants to create a view, I give them permissions to select data from my table or some other permissions, so they create a view, what are they allowed to do with my table? So it's not just permissions, it's inheritance of permissions. And what are the impacts? What is the impact if I want to update data through the view back to one or more tables? What is allowed and what is not allowed based on the various options that you set up. So you need to be really comfortable with that. The best way of doing that is to literally get in there and build a couple of tables, build a view on it, 
log in as somebody else and try it. You only need to do it a couple of times. In my case, it, it just took a couple of times for that before, oh yeah, they can't do this because they don't have write permissions to that table through the view. How do I fix it? Then you go start playing with SQL options to make it happen. So all about the change permission chains. Um, back, I can't remember when they made the switch from DBO owning everything to schemas. I think it was 08. Couldn't remember if it's 05 or 08. Second? Okay. Um, so what is the impact of that? So if a schema owns certain objects on the use of those objects by other schemas. This particular topic when I'm teaching SQL hangs a lot of people up. You know, if it's just a table or a view, they're really comfortable assigning permissions. But if I need some from this schema and this schema, and they're owned by different, um, owned by different roles, and they have different sets of permissions, that's when you start getting to issues. At this level of exam, those are the kinds of things that you will encounter. Solve that problem. Another sample question. This is something called a build list. They're not my favorite, but for a lot of things, they do a great job. These are first steps. You know, there is a prescribed set of steps that has to be done in a certain order and has to be done in that order and that order alone. As a practitioner of SQL, there are a lot of those things you've identified where you can't do this until you do that. You have to know those steps, and you would expect the people that you're having implement to know those steps. So we've got a database that has sensitive information. So before you even see the options, what are you assuming that you might need to do? Encrypt, right? So we're, we're already thinking encrypting. So this item is targeting or telegraphing that we're going to need to do some encryption. So then you get your wheel spinning and think about what are those steps that I might need to do to do encryption? When I restore this database elsewhere, I don't want anybody else at that site location to be able to see the data. What do you do? When you see a build list, generally it will say either what should you do or which X steps should you use. Sometimes it tells you how many you need, sometimes you have to figure it out. There'll always be an instruction st statement in these kind of things, usually has parentheses around it. Vast majority of people, just like those dialog box that pop up and you just click OK without reading, Never read that. It can hurt you. There's a lot of important detail that's included in those. The first step when you get a build list is to think about the process. What would I do? Have I done this? Do I remember what I thought I needed to do? I typically write them down on the board, they, the piece of paper they give you. And remove the steps in your mind so I don't need this bottom one. So now you know what you're dealing with and then you have this puzzle through. Okay, remember we had to do this, but we had, I think we had to do this before, not sure. So you want to start puzzling through what is the order of items. So if you were doing an encryption and you don't want it to be readable, are there any steps here that you can remove? And I can see a lot of people kind of working through the logic. And this is what you'll do on the exam. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of move us through. The bottom one, I got pulled out. And then sort it. What would you do first here? So master key. Let's see how we did. So create your key. Create the certificate based on the key. Create the database encryption key and then turn it on. Say again, go ahead. So the question is, do you get partial credit for getting part of it correct? The official answer is, I'm not going to tell you. So that is under NDA agreement. 
Um, so Microsoft does not divulge that kind of information. Um, I will tell you that they change things all the time based on trends. I do have a link for you elsewhere, I think it's further down in the deck, that actually has the official frequently asked questions, so the extent of what they'll show you, and there's actually decent information on that page. Say again? Partial opinion is just permanent, right. It's not. So I assume, I always assume that I had to get the whole thing right. Um, I spend a lot of time on these specifically because I know the steps generally are pretty good at that, but it's been months since I did it. I don't remember last week. How am I going to remember something I did months ago? But those key kinds of order dependent things, and there are not too many of them, that are critical for performance or functionality, you want to be aware of. But there are more of these than there used to be where you would say choose the following, you know, choose X number out of the following, you have to order. Yes. So the comment is really about item types in, in, as in a general and how it is now versus how it was then. And we're going to have a short conversation at the end about the tools that we have to build items for you. Another question, notice the text in the orange, red, whatever color that is. That is the instruction statement. A typical multiple choice, if it is a choose one and only one, you're going to get radio buttons, option buttons. You can only pick one. If it's more than one, you're going to see check boxes on the interface. The important distinction is that the exam interface may or may not tell you if it says choose four and you choose five, it might not tell you. Read the instruction statement. It'll tell you generally, instead of just what should you do, which three options should you use. And then it'll say each is part of a solution, so you have to do all three steps in whatever order. And this is not order dependent. Or each one is a separate. I could do it this way. You know, I can do it PowerShell. I can do it UI. I can do it with a DML statement. So. That's a consideration that you need to worry about. So in this particular question, anybody want to toss out a, somebody said E? Any others? It's more fun if we have more than one. So he said E and maybe B. Gary, pick a letter or two. C. So choose another one, because it's two. E. And while I'm on the subject, I forgot to introduce Gary. My apologies. Gary is an, my esteemed, he's an IT pro uh, guru. Gary is also a Microsoft trainer, and he did a presentation, or two, actually two, earlier in the week. Okay. Let's find out. So, in this case, that is correct. Big consideration here is locking granularity. So the overarching concept here is concurrency. Do I need, you know, there's a balance between data consistency and lack of data loss and how many people can actually be in there playing with the data at the same time. So you need to understand at a decent level what's happening. You know, if we've got multiple operations going on that are affecting the same groups of records, if the locks are inconsistent or one of them has a different type of lock, it, it may pre prevent the other action. <clears throat> Give you an analogy. When it comes to laundry, my wife and I hate doing laundry. There is no concurrency issue. Nobody goes near the laundry room. But if we're down in New Orleans, going to get some roasted oysters, charboiled oysters, there is a concurrency problem. We're both at the door, like on the, you know, the, Three Stooges car the Three Stooges movie, banging at the door trying to get in before the other one to get the, the oysters. So you need to understand the impact of locking. You need to understand table hints. How do I, if it's misbehaving or not behaving the way I want it to, to give 
one preferential treatment with hints. Isolation levels. What are the general isolation levels that you can deal with? So we've got serializable. What else do we have? Read committed and uncommitted. We've also got snapshot isolation level. That's the one that tip people typically have issues with the, the effects of doing snapshots of the data. How does that affect the transactions? So if I take a snapshot, you guys can be reading data from the snapshot while somebody else is doing something. So we can improve concurrency, but we can also introduce a lot of other issues. So you have to, you'll, see, you'll see content. I mean, it's an important concept. You're guaranteed you'll see content that tests your knowledge of how to deal with these things. So another variation on multiple choice is the choose all that apply. These are very challenging items. You will spend more time, and you should, on these than a lot of the other types. Really, knowledge of all the tools. Which ones of these tools, so there are four, four tools, which ones will actually solve the problem? If you've never used the tool, never read about the tool, but you know the name, it may not help you. If you've used it, so we're not testing necessarily on use, really on capabilities, and what is in your toolbox when a problem happens on that live server? Where do you go? So B, is it only B or are there other options? OK, so I'm hearing A and B. Anybody else? So A and B are indeed the correct set. We don't tell you how many options. We just tell you there are multiple, potentially. Indexes. So earlier, and, and in the 461 exam, can you create an index with DDL or using the UI? It's typically DDL, or excuse me, DML. Can you create the index? Here, it's all about Modifying the index, it's about rebuilding index, setting the padding on index, computing statistics on index, when, where, why, all of those other factors that affect the performance of a query. What you'll see, and there's going to be a recurring theme here in these various functional groups, index comes up and sort of index comes up and it comes up again later when we talk about execution plans. It's all interrelated. So I may say that there's, in the execution plan section, you'll see one. I need to improve the performance. And one of the things may be to rebuild the index or set, redo the statistics or something like that to solve the problem. They don't tell you it's an indexing rate of problem. It may be. So if you've dealt with indexes or people are trying to insert and it's very slow or query and it's very slow, what do you do? When should I rebuild versus reorganizing the index? And then tuning and maintenance strategy. That's another double-edged sword. How often is often enough to maintain the performance level? On the reverse side, what is the performance level that you expect? Now, how many of you have gotten those calls, the query runs slow? What does that mean? If you can say, well, I executed it last week and it took a couple of minutes. Today it's taking 12. That is a measurable thing and you can actually do some actions against it. So you know now that something is actually wrong. What are you going to do about it? So there'll be a lot of what are you going to do about it questions in any of these expert level exams. Data types. How many of you do development at all? So do you build CLR objects for SQL? Um, and, and that's typical. Most DB admins and database experts and architects are not building the actual CLR objects. They're specifying, I need something. This is what I'm going to send into it. This is what needs to come out of it. Build it. So they call me, or you, a couple of people, say build it. Your Requirement as a SQL admin person is to understand how do I make that available? 
So there are multiple steps. You have to turn on the CLR. You have to enable it so that SQL Server will allow you to see it. You've got to mark or have the developer mark the code correctly such that it can be used with the permission levels in SQL Server. So it's marked for safe. Or can it get to things outside of the SQL Server sandbox, like the mail subsystem or other file system objects? So you need to enable it. You need to build a thing. You need to register it and make it available, and then write a query to show that it does indeed do what it's supposed to do. In the simplest forms, you don't necessarily need to build one. There are some online labs. One of them that was up on Virtual Lab, it might actually have been part of the SQL 2008R2. Virtual Labs was actually about taking a pre-built CLR object, bringing it into a SQL Server database, and then using it. Spatial data. How many of you are dealing with geographical? What are you actually doing with it, sir? Based on geography, okay. So the, the comment was, um, I've got sales reps that have location where they deal with. If it's here, one person gets it. If it's literally, don't go near the speakers. If it's a little closer, um, somebody else gets it. So SQL Server does a wonderful job of dealing with spatial data. There are a lot of new features in SQL Server 2012 to make it easier. So first they implemented it, then they made it easy. Or I don't consider it easy, easy, but I'm starting to get the hang of it. So how do I actually implement it? What's the difference between a geography object and a geometry object? So the data that they return and how they behave is slightly different. You need to be aware of the kinds of objects and what, at the very least, you put something in, what am I going to get out? And how does it work? Column stores. I don't remember when they came out. I'm thinking 2008. But R2? OK. And then sparse columns. So columns with a lot of null values. If you use the sparse feature, you can vastly reduce the amount of storage for the data in that column. So SQL Server will re-optimize the data for that column to minimize wasted space. Um, if you've ever done anything with Microsoft Access, whether you use that picture field at all, you're taking up the space. So you always see those Access files and like some of the SQL Server Express used to, or MSD before SQL Server Express used to be the ever-expanding file for non-use stuff. So SQL Server 2012 does a great job, if you set it up that way, to remove a lot of the unused space to more efficiently use storage. Which brings us to a simple question related to sparse columns. So we're going to create a basic table. The key feature here is data types. So think about data types. Think about the constraints on these fields. And I'll come back to it so you can see it. So this question is really an applied knowledge. Do I know what a sparse column is, what it can do for me, and then do I know the limitations? So based on the limitations of the various, of, of the sparse columns, which data types can I actually use the sparse keyword with. So can I use it on a primary key column? And if you don't know, logic through this. So, you know, primary key constraints are a special type of control that SQL Server uses. So my head, before I even knew what sparse columns were when I first read about it, is, yeah, probably not. And then what I'm thinking in my head is, well, if they're not, other column types or data types with special considerations may also fall into that. You, know, you can't do anything else special because it's already special. So if there are 
different types of fields that are not your standard primitive data types, logical guess would be maybe not. So based on that, I've got a timestamp, a couple of RCHRs, something with a default value. Which ones would you actually put back? Could you just tell me which, which ones you think might? So logically, my head says doc ID should not be allowed to be sparse. Are there any others that you would think might not be allowed to be sparse? Okay, and somebody else said something too. Okay, so version timestamp. <clears throat> oh, I was reading, my, my brain was thinking the negative versus the offices. I was looking for the other ones to be lit up, but I didn't read the question. So the moral of the story is you have to read what it's looking for. I will tell you that in general, Microsoft frowns on item writers building in the knots yeah, or the um, you know, double negatives and things like that. Creating and modifying constraints. How much time do I have left, sir? Uh, okay. Cool. So primary key constraints, null constraints, default constraints, all of those types of things. You would have already probably taken the 461 exam. So the actual implementation is one thing, and then there's a question of, at this level, how should I do it based on a business constraint? So if I give you a business scenario, what should you do here? What kind of constraint should you use, and how should you configure it? XML data. How many of you have XML data and you're, you're working with it? It's not my favorite thing to work with because I started with it when the SQL Server really first started supporting it and it, the tooling was not wonderful. So I have that bad taste in my mouth and I just can't get it out. Import, so you need to know how do I get the XML into a column? How do I then query that XML related column to find a set of nodes for each row or whatever it is that I need? Let me um, walk you through the, the next section. Uh, automating backup testing. And this one, what does that mean? So there are routines. Tell it to automatically back itself up and do what it needs to. So PowerShell, you're not necessarily going to need PowerShell here. There are different UI, maintenance plans, SQL jobs that you can set up to do some of those things. Checking your index fragmentation. If you actually run some of the reports and look at it, do you know what it means when you see the index fragmentation? Pages and percentages and things of that nature. How many of you would say that you're comfortable with that? Notice that my hand's not up. And I had one that was kind of a, kind of. That's very typical. But when you're dealing with performance, it's really important that you understand that you know, I've got a lot of columns that are indexed and how it behaves. Running an SSIS job, so what are we thinking? We think SQL agent, um, getting parameters in or doing not deep level. That's not the purpose of this exam, is to invest, get into the innards of SSIS packages. This is really how do I, as an admin, set it up for execution to make it happen. Same thing with stored procedures. You already know how to build them. How do I get data in? How do I get data out? What can I put into a stored procedure? What kind of data can I get out? Analyzing and rewriting. So I've got something that's a stored procedure. There was an issue with it, or we want to add a feature. First question is, should I? Second question is, how do I actually do that? And then dealing with table value parameters, how do I get them in and out and work with that? Table value parameters and things of that nature are extremely important in SQL Server, and they were really important in the exams for 2008 and should be going forward. So designing functions. So this is not necessarily writing it now. It's how do you design it so you can get what you need done? <coughs> Excuse me. 
altering it, and then specifically cross-apply as it pertains to user-defined functions. What does it mean? How do I deal with it? It's an important consideration. Best practices for views. So do you give your people permission to tables or just views and stored procedures? Or how do you want to set that up based on the business constraints and rules in place? And we've got database objects and specifically partitioning, file streams. File streams, uh, there are some new features associated with SQL Server 2012 for storing things in the file system and having SQL. As far as you're concerned, SQL Server it's in there, but it's actually not. It's in the file system. How do I get things in and out between the two? So we're dealing with something in the sandbox, SQL Server, and then going outside the sandbox to the file system. There are some considerations to turn it on and make it happen, and then performance and other issues. Partitioning your tables, you need to understand the why and the how to do it. So if I give you a business scenario, we got X number of data, we typically do reports based on a per month. It telegraphs, I need to partition by this. It won't be that simple, but along that same idea, you'll puzzle through, okay, how do I need to design that partitioning strategy? And then which of these SQL statements, or how do I build the SQL statement from pieces that will let it happen? This section, the bottom part, is to me the most important. Given a business situation where you've got a bunch of indexes set up, which ones is SQL Server going to use? And if not, why is it not using the ones you thought it would? Why is it doing a table row by row scan when you have an index on the column you're looking for? How do I get it to use that index to speed up performance? Set a primary key. It's a fairly I won't say lower level, but it's something you learn earlier on. To, to, how do I choose what type? So this level is going to be more about the performance implications or the business implications of the data type that you choose. You see, it kind of comes back around. We talked a little bit about concurrency already. So how do I make it so that the maximum number of people can use my database with good performance. So committed, snapshots, snapshot isolation, all of those factors come back in. I'm going to show you, I think this is the last item uh, flavor. This is active screen. For developer and SQL exams, we used to have what I call a Weir's Waldo question. You get four answer choices, each with maybe a dozen lines of code. And each answer choice, there might be two or three slight differences. So your first job is hunting and pecking to find what's different before you can even start considering which one solves the problem. These new active screen, we give you the 10 or 10, line, 10 or 12 lines of code once. We give you drop down boxes that represent the variable parts and you simply have to pick what is the appropriate thing for that particular um, option. For those of you that have taken exams, does that sound like it might be a cool innovation? Um, and it absolutely is. Having, take, having taken exams the other way and this way, I don't have to scroll. I don't have to hunt and pack. I can go right to solving the business problem. So here's a quick example. I should probably tell you what the question is first. Um, how many, basically we're looking for locked, blocked transactions. That's all it is. That's, you'll see something like this. So I've got two pieces of code that I need to fill in. We've got to go and put in something for this. So which one would you assume? Oops. <laughs> um, and then for the second one, choose. So which state would you use to identify those blocked transactions? Operations, excuse me. Suspended. So this is just another way of asking, and I think it's a very user-friendly, and I am focusing just on that as opposed to interface stuff. So designing for 
transactions and distributed transactions amongst multiple databases. You have to be really comfortable with what can I do? What happens when I roll, up trans roll back transactions? What about nested transactions? Let's say you've got three or four levels of nested. And on one of the levels, something doesn't work. How far back does it go? And undo what you did. So you need to be aware of how I interact with that. <clears throat> and last but not least, let me get to you to the troubleshoot and kind of walk through that. I know I'm running out of time. Optimizing and fine tuning. Can you look at an execution plan? Take a look at a question that relates to I need to solve a performance issue. I'll show you the execution plan. What should you do to fix it? So this is a great way if you've got a SQL server stood up and you are actively doing this. And there is a virtual lab on TechNet that was up there that was all about kind of some performance things. It's worthwhile. How do you actually go through the process of troubleshooting? Tuning the workload. So understanding what you have in your specific business how do I make it the best performance for what I have? And so you may, I may show you this, ask you a question around this. I've got index scans, I've got hash jobs, I've got another index scan. I may say I have a performance issue. What do I do with this to improve the time to completion? And one of your day-to-day -day roles is the care and feeding of the SQL Server, keeping your customers happy. How do I make sure that everything is running as fast as possible? Optimizing strategy, so using the include to change the way that indexing is performed, that has a drastic good and or bad impact on performance. So execution plans. If you see that, it's 97.6% of the workload was all in a key lookup. That's generally not good for performance. How do you adjust to remove that so it does something different? Extended events, profiling, all of those typical tools you need to be aware of if you've done it a couple of times. So there's an awareness level. It's not going to be, how do I add? a counter to performance monitor. It's going to be, you're looking at something. What's going wrong here? What's going on related to the business situation? Last but not least, take the exam. So it's actually helpful that this is on a Thursday morning, because Thursday mornings, typically, the exam room is pretty tightly booked. I don't generally like people to come into one of these and then walk out and take the exam. It was really all about identifying where you are and where you need to go to get here. But the day of, <clears throat> we'll get to it real quick. We saw a multiple choice. We saw a build list. We saw an active screen in one way. We saw a code base active screen. I might actually give you a presentation of a dialogue, a user interface piece in SQL Server. How do you confer, or how do you turn on something or configure something? It might have option buttons, checkboxes, drop-down lists. And you are actually interacting as if it were live, instance of SQL Server, to make it happen. Analysis. This is a fairly new type. I'm going to give you a block of code and then a couple of questions about it. What does it do? What kind of result does it return? So it allows us to ask a little more in-depth. You have to look through it and think through the code to decide what's happening with it. So it's real world types of situations. There is one more flavor of multiple choices called the best answer. And best answers, even though it sounds subjective, are not meant to be subjective. It's not the best way and the Microsoft way and the Microsoft way is the correct. It really is. This one does 95%. This one does 100. So it a, requires a deep level of understanding what does this tool or thing do, and does it do the whole job? And then drag and drop. Drag and drop is like an active screen, but instead of choosing that drop-down list and picking an option, I'm going to give you part of the code and give you a placeholder, drag over the piece that meets your needs. One more type of item is called a case study. 
How many of you do consulting? So tell me if this is correct. You walk into a lot of clients, they give you a five minute meeting and a couple of documents and say, go fix it. So it's not quite enough in a lot of ways. And then they start asking questions. So you start asking questions, what about this, what about that? A case study is going to be a short background, business requirements, technical requirements, and then some questions surrounding it. In the test environment, they do behave a little differently. They are a test within a test. So that actual case study document and the, the number of questions that go with it are one little island within the test. But they are real world situations that you have to implement. Four case studies, read all the questions first. That works really well. Go back, make some notes, and then go back and actually read the case study. So you're doing targeted reading. And then go back and answer the questions. This is Microsoft's official link for talk, they, where they actually give you the public information about item types and there are short little videos. How do you actually work with each so you get an experience what it looks like in an actual exam interface. Prometric.com, I think there are probably a few slots here today. Um, as of last night, they were pretty full in the testing center. On exam day, take your time. Don't bring a lot of stuff with you because I'm going to make you put it in a locker. Write down notes to yourself about items. I, a lot of times put, when I'm deciding what's wrong, or write, I write down the letters or A, B, C, D, and I start crossing them off. Don't second guess. Relax, because remember, you can have lunch after you finish your exams or adult beverage. Some related content I want to mention really quickly. There's some breakout sessions. You know, most of them have already happened. Um, there's another exam prep. Armando is in the back getting ready to start up. He is going to deliver the 465, which is the other half of the MCSE track. There are some hands-on labs. There's still time to go actually try this technology. Then these are just a couple that I picked up. Database encryption is important, and the data platform is a bunch of little bits thrown together to give you a flavor of what's there. The exam prep that's coming up. I've also got some information. Um, email. You can find me on LinkedIn. I typically don't do a lot on Twitter because I just takes too much time. And Facebook I use for family, but you can find me in the database certification study groups. If you put a question up there, it, it comes to my email. Or in the training and certification forum. There are a whole bunch of other resources available for you. And last but not least, please tell me what I can do better next time. Um, constructive comments are wonderful. Uh, Non-constructive comments, not so much. But you know, I appreciate your time. Look forward to you, and I do have business cards if anybody's interested. If you have questions going forward, I, you know, Gary and Armando will agree, as trainers, we're sort of addicted to certifications. We love doing this. We love the outreach because when we get that email from you telling us that you passed that exam, that's the best feeling in the world. Um, it knows that we did something right to help and we got you in the right direction. So with that, thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>